And uh, so go on the website and donate. It's easy. Go with your card. Hallelujah. Come and see us, though. Most of all, that's what we want, is you to come to the Road Angel Trucker Center. We got a few people here that are in this morning. We'll just appreciate that. And, uh, and we're going to have a great time. Um, I'm just going to sing a little bit. Just a little. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, I don't remember the rest of it. So what something for Anybody remember those words? Oh, what deeds with shame we bear. All because we do not care. Everything to God in prayer. You carry everything to God in prayer? Man, he's waiting. He's sitting there waiting. Come on, talk to me, people. I brought Jesus to reconcile you to me so we can talk. Come and talk to me. How do we talk to him? Go into the throne room. Father, in the name of Jesus. That's how Jesus told us to pray. He said, don't pray to me anymore. Pray to the Father in my name. So we go in there, Father, in the name of Jesus. Now you're standing right before God. He sees you as whole and perfect. You can ask anything according to his will, and it will be done. Amen? Hallelujah. Any testimonies today? <laughs> you go to your testimony. Well, I got a testimony. God is good. And his mercy endures forever. We have had some tremendous things happen. We've had uh, some healing. We've had salvation. Um, we've had lots of things happen in the last couple of weeks because God is really moving in this time. Now, in the industry, it's slow. But for God, it's not. It's time. Remember, our base scripture is Isaiah chapter 60. Arise and shine for the... Your time has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The power, the glory, the very thing that created the heavens and the earth, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, is, is upon you. And people should be able to see that light. And they should be drawn to that light. We'll get into that later, because I didn't start preaching yet. I'm on my way. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, any other testimonies? Something God did for you this week. I can't believe God didn't do anything for you this week. Hallelujah. Crickets. Yeah, Zane, leave that microphone, please. Right. Yeah, if you want to quit feeling sorry for yourself, just look around and see where some people, other people are at. You know? Hallelujah. I mean, I'm 68 and doing great, and I have, I have a, a situation where I can do something every day and keep active and keep doing working for God. I mean, that's just a privilege. But, you know. I mean, some people are 68 and they're just laying around in the lounge chair waiting to die. I'm not waiting to die. I'm waiting to be with Jesus. <laughs> not saying I won't die because it's appointed on the man once. Once to die, right? But see, after that, it's eternal life. You know what? It's eternal if you don't know Jesus. You need to understand something. You are an eternal being one way or the other. If you choose Jesus, you choose life. You're what's you're with him on streets of gold, like I always say, I trade him a Chevy body for a Cadillac. But what's happening to somebody that doesn't know Jesus? They're in separation from God. See, people talk about hell, well, it's fire and brimstone. Well, the lake of fire is reserved for the devil and his angels, right? But you are going to be in outer darkness if you don't know God. You don't know Jesus. 
You're just going to be separated completely. No way back. Completely separated from God, no way back. And you're going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth. So don't think, you know, I'm just going to die and that's it. No, you're an eternal being right now. So let's be eternal beings who are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's kind of weak. Amen? amen? All right, let's get that going. I mean, if you can't amen the blood of the Lamb, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, well, we will move on to prayer requests. Does anybody have a prayer request? Hallelujah. Well, we're still believing for that Chevy Blazer, Deb and I are. We sold for it, we looked at it, we decided what we wanted, and we're claiming it in Jesus' name. I'm doing it publicly just so you can see that God will do what he says he'll do. It's going to be a late model, not a lot of miles on it, because that'll do what we need to do here. Now, if God gives me something better, I'm not going to complain. Okay? Somebody said, well, maybe somebody will give you an order. I said, no, that's not what we asked for. I said, we asked for late model, low miles. I said, that's what we need for this ministry. So I'm not going to put my faith any lower than that. Hallelujah. Any questions? Right. Pastor Mark at the Association of Christian Truckers, Association of Christian Truckers at gmail.com. Hallelujah. Call me. I'll give you my number. 507 271 6108. Hallelujah. <laughs> Mark, don't you get, uh, uh, what do they call them? Uh, all the calls, you know, people that call you. Don't you get the guys, uh, commercial calls and all that? And I said, yeah, but as soon as I say, hi, this is Pastor Mark. How can I help you? Like, they said, they're going to try to sell me something. Well, they got to hear a cheery voice, you know. Maybe I sow the seed. I don't know. Hallelujah. Any prayer requests? Praying for Morgan. She's progressing. Crystal, how'd she do a therapy this week? Go to the microphone. I want to testify. Hallelujah. <clears throat> it says to pray that she doesn't have any fear and anxiety because she still gets scared of falling so she has to do therapy they have to understand that she's broken how many times has she broken bones a lot a lot <laughs> over 13 times she's had broken bones and so now she's at an age where she's almost 13 and now it's kind of get the reality of it is there, and she's starting to think, man, I don't even want to walk because I'm afraid I'll fall down. But that fear has to go in Jesus' name. Amen? I'm encouraging her to be, be courageous, be strong, be brave, all of those things. So God has not given us a spirit of fear. So we find that spirit of fear that can't operate anymore, and we thank you, Lord, that faith rises up in her. That she can do all things through Christ that strengthens her. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Pray for Ryan today. He's had some just kind of stomach troubles and stuff, you know. He was going to be here first thing this morning, but he called me. said, hey, I can't make it. That's great. I'm, I'm here to back him up. <laughs> I said, I got your back, brother. Don't worry about it. So anyway, but Father, we pray for Ryan right now. We help. We ask that you would heal and move in, in him and, uh, and make him even stronger than he is, than he was, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How you doing, young man? Hey, praise God. We're at a little church here if you want to join, or whatever you need to do. All right? Hallelujah. Okay, anything else? Anything else anybody wants to say? Speak now or the next time. But don't forever hold your peace. 
We need to speak into this world what we want, what we see, what we care about. We need to get it out there. You know, being silent is not the way. Declare what God has said. I'll live and not die to to, to, uh, (laughs) do. I'll live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Now, the Bible says that, and you might have read that. But if you don't declare it, it doesn't become personal. It doesn't become part of you. It's not something you're saying. I'm saying what God's saying. If I agree with him, it's going to come to pass. God healed me of COVID in three days. And I was ready to go on the ventilator. I told my doctor, give me one night. We prayed together. And the next day I was a third better. <clears throat> he said, and I've never seen this in all the patients that I've treated here at Vandalia Hospital. And I said, well, I was expecting better, so let's pray again. We prayed that very for all the doctors, all the nurses, all the patients in that hospital. I prayed for him. I prayed for the or eight uh, COVID patients. And he was crying at the end of that prayer both days. And he said, man, you got a gift. I said, brother, you got the same gift. You told me you're a Christian. Jesus said, those that believe shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Every Christian has that if you believe, but you got to believe that. Well, I just don't believe that's for today. Well, good. Just get out of my way. I got to lay hands on the sick so they can recover. Amen. Oh, do what Jesus, that's in red letters. That's not just something the apostle said. That's what Jesus said. Those that believe shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall cast out devils. He didn't say they'll speak with new tongues until the disciples die. That's not what he said. He said they shall speak with new tongues. They'll cast out devils. I've cast out devils before. You can do it. Now, you don't do it as a badge. Oh, I'm going to cast out devils. No, that's not it. But if somebody has a need, person needs your help, and you need to cast out a devil, you need to stop up and say, okay. I don't even know what I'm doing, but God, show me. Right? God's got to show you. Hallelujah. I don't know why I'm saying all this. Somebody needs to hear it. Those that believe, do you believe? Do you cling to? Do you trust in? Do you rely on Jesus? That's what that word means in the Greek. It doesn't mean what the English meaning is. The English meaning for believe is more or less persuaded of. And we got a ton of that in the church, and you're all going to hell. Yeah, I said it. Well, I said a prayer. But there's no fruit. There's nothing going on in your life. You don't know Jesus. If you knew him, you'd be doing something. If you knew him, You would be praising him. You'd be projecting him in your life every day. If you're not, stop and get saved. Get him in your heart. Man, when he comes in there, it's a blast. I don't know, man. I wish I could put my head in somebody else's for 10 seconds. It would help. Hallelujah. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. I get an amen. Amen. All right. Well, we'll get to my nugget here. Let's see how much time I got. Yeah, I'm okay. I didn't title this because we've been in this ongoing series where we're talking about Isaiah chapter 60 and how that applies to us today. We are the one. I'm just going to. Did you get that up there? Okay. It, it, can you go to the end, Crystal? Um, Isaiah chapter 60 is on the last page, I think. I just, I just decided I want to read that one. You were just sat down so that... Uh, hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 4. I mean, we could go a lot further, but... 
This gives you the gist of it. Hey, good morning. How you doing? Good. You can come and have church with us if you'd like. Um, but it gives us the gist of it. It says, arise, shine. Rise, shine. That's just a thing in itself. That's an action in itself that you have to do every day, right? We arise. Now we got to shine. Father, thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah. Thank you that I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Thank you that I, you, you've forgiven me for every sin and buried it in the deepest sea and be remembered no more. I repent for any sin that I don't know about, and I repent for whatever I did yesterday. Today, I am coming before you clean, ready to go. What are we doing today, Lord? You just never know. Rise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Do you understand what the glory of the Lord is? That is powerful. When the glory came down and filled the tabernacle, the priests could not stand to minister. They couldn't stand up. I've been in that situation where the anointing was so strong I could barely stand up. That's the glory of God, people. And you should have that with you every day, and it should be around you. That's why when the disciples walked by people, Paul walked by people, they were getting saved. They were getting healed. Just by the shadow. What was the shadow? The glory of God. Hallelujah. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. How many knows the darkness is on the earth right now? Can anybody deny that this earth is not in darkness? It is in darkness. And gross darkness, the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. His glory says it again. The Lord's going to rise up on you. When people are around. Because there's gross darkness on the people. and They need the light to be able to see. But that light comes from you, folks. If you're Christians, if you know Jesus and he's living inside you by the Holy Spirit, that light should, remember that song? This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine. But it's not a little light, it's the glory of God. You'd have to have a big bushel to keep the glory of God from shining, right? Yeah. It's there. It's in you. If you know Jesus, it's in you now. If you don't know Jesus, get saved because then it'll be in you. The very power that created the universe will be inside of you. Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. That's, that's a fact. Just the facts, Jack, right? And Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Gentiles, unsaved people, are going to come to your light. They're going to come to the road angel because they're going to say, I need to get saved. You need something to eat, young man? All right, where are you headed? Where are you headed? All right. Well, I hope you come back and see us again. All right, brother. Help that guy wake up, Lord. Jesus. Behold, the darkness, I don't know where he did that. The Gentiles shall come to your light. The Gentiles, the kings will come to your rising. Kings, people of authority, important people are going to come to you if you'll let your light shine. Lift up your eyes round about and see. Remember in... Uh, when Elijah was in the cave with his servant, and he was talking about the servant said, Oh man, these guys are attacking us. They got 10,000 soldiers or whatever. And Elijah said, Oh, we're opening his eyes. Let us see. And he looked out and he saw all these chariots of fire and angels, just thousands and thousands of them. And, and, and he said, Those that are for us are greater than those that are against us. Because he looked around and saw. 
spiritually. You have to look around and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed by your side. Your family's coming back. The ones you've been believing for, they're going to be there by your side. And you're going to see and flow together. What's that? Flow together. All of us together. Amen? Working together, body of Christ. And your heart will fear and be enlarged because of the abundance of the seed that shall be converted unto you. The forces of the Gentiles shall come to you. We're going to have, you're going to get, you're going to look around and go, whoa, I got a hundred trucks coming in here. What am I going to do with them all? Right? Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. I'm getting excited. So, I want to read you this little excerpt that I heard this week. Romans 5, 18 and 19, back at the beginning. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. I'm talking about Adam, right? Resulting in condemnation. And even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men. That's Jesus being crucified on the cross. Resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That's pretty awesome. One man. Adam affected generations. But one man, Jesus, took him back and gave him the opportunity. So here's the question. Is by our obedience are many affected? Or are they affected by our disobedience to not follow God? People are watching you. Folks, we need to be aware. You know, they're watching you. They're watching me right now. I can't pick my nose on TV, right? No, but I'm just saying, people are watching you. Well, I saw him cussing out somebody the other day. Boy, what kind of Christian is he? Hey, I saw him praying for that lady and helping her across the street. Man, that seems like something I'd like to do. Are you seeing it? Which, which way are you? Are you going to be obedient so that you'll have the glory of the Lord upon you and the kings and everybody else is coming to see you because you have that light. Not under a little bushel, but under a huge, huge, there's no container. No container can contain God. So, I thought I'd read some of the Psalm 119, 9 through 16. Uh, Psalm 119, long the Psalm in the book. But it says, Wherewithal, or how, shall a young man cleanse his way? How many's got that question out there? How can I cleanse my way? Come on in. <coughs> Hallelujah. You guys need to use the bathroom? Yep, back and to the left. Yep. You can come in for service if you want to, or if we can get you something to eat if you need it. Okay. All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. So by taking, uh, how does a man, how does a young man cleanse? How do you cleanse your way? Man, I've done this and this, and I've been here and there, and I've, you know, I've done this. And how, what am I going to do? I'm just a turd. How am I going to get turned around? It's right here. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. A young man can cleanse his way by listening to God's word. What word? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right? That's how you take heed to God's word. So if you have questions out there and you need Jesus, just go to John 3, 
16, and it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe, trust in, cling to, rely on Jesus. Realize that God raised him from the dead so that you would have eternal life. Hallelujah. That's how a young man cleanses us his way. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me my, thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of my mouth. I have declared. I have rejoiced in the way of my testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in the precepts and have respect unto your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. That's a pretty good confession. Guys should say that every day, probably. Right? Amen? Everybody awake? Amen. Amen. Is this you? Are you seeking with your whole heart? With my whole heart, I have sought thee. My whole heart. Have you sought with your whole heart, or are you keeping a part of it back? Well, I'm not going to surrender that. I'll surrender this, but I'm not going to surrender that. No, oh, it says, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Man, if you seek God with your whole heart, I mean, seek him with your whole heart. He says, seek me early while I might be found. You know what he's talking about? You know, people keep saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll get there. Thank you, guys. Seek, you know, I mean, people say, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll do that later. I'll accept Jesus later. I'll have time. You don't know if you have time. You can walk out this door and one of these trucks could hit you. Or you're talking negative. No, no, I'm just saying it. You don't have time. Now is the time. Today is the day if you harden not your heart. See, when you say, well, I'll do it later, you're hardening your heart. You're saying, that's not important. I don't have to do that right now. No, you need to do it now. You need to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. Thank him for being your Savior. Thank him for being the propitiation for all your sins. Thank you that he has saved you, and all your sin is as far as the east is from the west. Thank him that he'll, old things will pass away, and all things will become new. All things. Hallelujah. With my whole heart I've sought thee, oh, let me not wander from your commandments. They're asking God to help keep them from wandering, Right? You can do that. God, help keep me from wandering. Let me know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Who? God's going to teach him his statutes? Of course. And he'll use a man. He said, how will they know unless they hear a preacher? Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. So I thank God that scripture's in there, right? Hallelujah. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have declared. We're supposed to declare. Hear ye, hear ye. Right? Hear ye, hear ye. I declare. What do you declare? Jesus Christ is Lord. One time I went across the Canadian border and they said, what do you declare? And I said, the United States is the greatest country in the world. Pull it over, drivers. <laughs> but declare, why do they say that? Tell me what you have is what they're saying when they say declare. Tell me what you got. Let me hear what you got. Declare. Oh, where am I at? Oh, okay. I went, I went over this one thing a little too fast. It says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. <coughs> I don't know what to do. I just keep on sinning. Get the word in your heart. Read your Bible. Pray. 
get around good Christian people. It's simple. Unless you avoid it. Unless you stop it. It's you. Your decisions. Well, I'll, I'll do that another day, God. You don't have another day. Today. You know for sure today. You can ask Jesus into your heart to be saved, have eternal life, have the best life you could ever have. That doesn't mean that everything's a bed of roses, but I wouldn't sleep in roses anyway. So. But, uh, but, I mean, it means that you'll have Jesus living inside of you through the Holy Spirit, and he'll guide you, and he'll lead you into all truth. And he'll show you the way, and I'm telling you, he's got a sense of humor. God and I laugh all day long. I'll, say, I'll go to do something, and I'll say, okay, God, you know. And then he'll do it, and I'll say, oh. <laughs> I'll say, oh, man, you are so cool. I can't hardly believe you did that. With my lips I've declared, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all riches. The word is more important than all riches. I rejoice in God's testimony. What God's done. How he delivered the children of Israel. How he helped Paul get through his life. How he helped Peter. How he helped all the disciples. I rejoice in his testimony. I will meditate in my precepts and respect. Oh, respect. Respect. That's a word that's just out the door today. You know, I see people, an elderly woman coming in the store and some guy jamming himself in front of her. No, ladies first, open the door. Respect. Respect. Respect God. There's no respect for God today. Right? You see it everywhere. People don't respect God. He's not in the equation even. He's there, but they don't know it. But, but I mean, no respect for God. Respect unto your ways. Well, respect God's ways. Yeah. Ten Commandments, Golden Rule. It used to be people respected those things. It says... I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I will not forget your word. <clears throat> Bless that family, Lord, if they leave and have safety. Go down the road in Jesus. Hallelujah. I will not forget your word, God. If you can remember his word, then you know how to pray. Because you can pray his word. That always works, right? I like to pray for sick people. I like to say, uh, you know, I'm in your throne room, God. And I'm agreeing with you that by his stripes, that person is healed. That's what your word says. That's what Jesus took that weapon for. I'm going to apply that and believe that for that person. Nine times out of ten, they get healed. It's always the time that that's the day that they're appointed. The man wants to die. But, nevertheless, man, I'm going to agree with what God says, right? I'm not going to forget his statutes. <clears throat> Pretty quiet in this Presbyterian church. Hallelujah. Just saying, look at Psalm 119 and see if that's you. If it is, that's great. You're in good shape. You're believing God. You're listening to Him. You're respecting His precepts. You're talking about obedience. <laughs> I am. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. Trust me, you don't want sacrifice. I've been going through seven years of it. But it's okay. I chose it because I didn't obey God. Now, it's 
almost totally over. And I don't have time to explain it all to you, but the fact is, you want to be obedient. Amen? I don't understand it, guys. You don't have to understand it. You have to be obedient. Well, I want to do this. It's not about I want to. It's what has God told you to do? Well, I don't know. I can't hear from God. You got to get his word in your heart so you know what he's talking. And you got to read his word so he can talk to you out of that. Most people that say they can't hear from God don't read the word. Because he'll talk to you through his word just all the time. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Yeah, he does. I didn't get in that word. What did we talk about last week? The two edged sword of the word that divides between the bone and marrow and gets right down to the intent of your heart. Gets right down into that thing the word does. The word shows it like a like a floodlight on a part that you don't you don't want to believe. You know, it just goes down to Jesus so it goes to the big show. Shine that forward. Lay hands on a sake and now recover. There's a part down in there, the intense of your heart that says, I don't want to believe that. I'm rebellious. I know, I know Jesus said it, but I'm still not going to believe it. Okay, be rebellious. Be afraid. A lot of us are afraid to operate in gifts. You don't want to see supernatural things happen. Because you're afraid. Man, what if it don't work? What if it does? What if people walk? What if they're backstabbing? What if they're doing something else? Hallelujah. What if they say when you say, oh, would you like to see Jesus? They say yes. we do here every day. Drivers come in, we plant a seed. Whatever seed is, well, that ground will take. And we have to have discernment to know. Discernment is one of the gifts that you should really pray about. Because you need to be able to discern where people are at. Some of them will tell you. But a lot of times, you need a little discernment. Because what might seem like a crazy sinner is a guy that really wants to know really knows Jesus, but he's just kind of screwed up. You know, I've, I've, I've run into that before. So what am I saying? Isaiah chapter 60, Arise and shine, for the glory of the Lord is upon you. Get that in your heart. Read that over and over. You need to understand what's going to happen in these next days coming up. That's what's going to happen. The Gentiles are going to come to your rising. The, the sinners, the people that need Jesus, are going to come here. Because they know there's a light here. Drivers are going to come here that's been coming here for years and say, man, I need the real thing. I don't know what it is, but I need the real thing. There's a song like that. Ain't nothing like the real thing they can do. What is the real thing? It's Jesus. Right? All those songs, men twist the words. I can rewrite almost every one of those songs and it's Jesus. Stack those books and Bibles off the shelf. I sit and read them all by myself. Hallelujah. We can rewrite them. Make them Jesus songs. You gotta know the word though. See, you gotta know the word. All of it, you need the word. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Get this word inside of you. Chew it up. Swallow it. Chew it up again. Get with other Christians that you know are solid Christians and discuss and let iron sharpen iron. 
Find out what is the meaning. Why is that there? Who are they talking to? I'm telling you folks, if you just get into this, your life will change. Well, do I have to quit my job and all that? No. Just keep doing whatever you are doing. And if God leads you to do something else, that's that's one thing. But if you don't, keep doing it. But read your word. But pray. But get on your phone and stop looking at YouTube videos and talk to real Christians. Find you a couple solid Bible-believing preachers and listen to them. Don't be listening to all this conspiracy stuff. Well, I got a new revelation. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. What is it that Jesus told us to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel, proclaim the good news to every creature. Now, if we just concentrated on that, how many more people would be saved? But, oh no, we're running after revelations. I'm going over here. Jesus is over here. Jesus is over there. No. You've got enough in that Bible that's in front of you. Look how big this Bible is. There is enough in here for you to preach the gospel to every creature. You don't need a lot of extra revelation. You need to really get the revelation of this. Search you the scriptures, because in them you think you have it. That's for people who are ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. That's because they can't believe what it says. They can't read it and just take it for what it says. They have to find another meaning. Well, that doesn't really mean that, brother. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, man, I'd be a rich guy. Well, if it doesn't mean what it says, why am I reading it? Well, you have to understand the eschatology, retology, boom, blah, blah, blah. I don't. It was written for me. I just have to understand what it says. Now, I'll get a lot of flack on that. Oh, no, you got to study the deep things. And you got, yes, I'm a study. I like to study. I like to learn new things. But I'm telling you, if you're not winning people to Christ and you're not preaching the gospel to every creature before you even think about doing something like that, then you're lost. You're in a lost state. You might be saved, you might be going to heaven, but you're not with helping God. You're not doing anything. How many people do you want in Christ? I'm not saying you got to have a list and how, how many. But what I'm trying to say is, have you done it? Is God working through you and you're preaching the gospel? The good news can be a nugget. It can be something that leads, leads them to Christ on their own. But I, you know if you're doing that or not. Are you doing that? That's what us drivers should be doing. You need the drivers to teach, take this gospel to every place in this nation because that's where we go. We go everywhere. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. Well, if you've been everywhere and spread the gospel, then you ain't been there. said enough. But preach the gospel every creature. One more time. One more time. Preach the gospel to every creature. I'm going to write a song. I don't think I've ever heard a song written like that. I think I will write a song like that. Hallelujah. Well, folks, we're going to go to the um, awesome family church down in Bradenton, Florida. We're going to hear from Pastor Phil the president of our board of directors, and the pastor of the family church. We'll hear a little bit of worship before that, and uh, we'll take an offering at the same time they take their offering.
And I, I love you all. Thank you for listening today. Preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, <laughs> I'll be back at the end to wrap things up. But until then, you need to study up with Jesus. know the most important act of worship that we can do when we come together is just lay our lives down. Also, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. My life is not my own. Nevertheless, he says, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ living in me. Father, today, Lord, help us. Help us as spiritual people 
with an earth suit. Help us, Lord, to be most mindful of your spirit that leads us and guides us and lives through us. Oh, God, I pray, oh, God, spirit of the living God, arise in us and rise in your people. Lord, these, this day, oh, God, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will rise up, will rise up, will rise up in your people, oh, God. Hallelujah. Spirit of the living God. Arise, arise, arise in your people, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I would like some of you to just help me in sealing the Hispanic youth camp that we had in here this past week. You know, a week, a week ago, we had the youth camp that we orchestrate through our church here, over 500 teenagers. But last, year, last week, we assisted a number of Spanish churches to do another youth camp in here over 350 teenagers praising God in Spanish and English just as fired up as we were and I want to seal seal that today I'm going to ask Pastor Lewis and some others of you that speak Spanish to come up where are you Johan come on down if you would and uh, Sam and uh Sam and Jessica. Jessica, I asked you to bring that flag down, the victory flag that we were flying during the youth camp. And uh, we're going to fly it again. We're going to declare victory. Yeah, Brother Angel. Yeah. Come on up. Yeah, Michael come on. Don't Lloyd be shy. Justice. Come on. I'm going to ask the Hernandez family to come down, if you would. I know Sari is up interpreting everything I say in bring Spanish. Bring your parents. But we're going to pray. A lot of these young people getting back Sam. to their churches. Justice, yay. All right. Where's your dad? Mike. Brother Mike, come on down. Might have you preach today. Who knows? <laughs> you know what? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, she's usually interpreting up there in the upper room. I want you to know God's working in the Hispanic churches all over America. And so I hope they provoke us to jealousy because they're on fire. And uh, this week I had to step in some of the, the services and see it for myself. But listen, a lot of these young people are getting back to their homes, getting back to their churches. And uh, we need them to stay on fire. Amen. So uh, you're going to help us pray. You can pray in the Holy Ghost. And uh, I tell you what, Justin, I saw you during our youth camp. You were running around here on fire. Do not let the fire die out. Amen. You stay on fire. We need that fire in the next generation. Same with you. Sorry, I saw you on fire. You were in tears most of the week, as a lot of the young people were. And uh, Jessica, I saw the young people taking turns carrying that flag. Carlos, you're back. Yay. We've been praying for you. Yay. Can't keep a good man down. But I want you to wave that flag because we're declaring victory. Victory. Who's going to pray? <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's lift up our hands and let's, uh, let's put this generation in our hearts and in our mind. We have something precious. Hallelujah. To continue to proclaim not only for our families and ourselves, but for the generation that so desperately needs the answer, which is Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Father God, we lift up this generation who we see is being attacked, but it's because, Father God, they are, they are here, Lord, with purpose. They are the generation, Father God, that's going to go bolder than ever before. And Lord, we lift up, Father God, what you have been doing in their lives. Lord, your Holy Spirit has deposited in them, Lord Jesus. Your word, your power, Lord, we declare salvation. We declare the words that have been deposited to take root in their lives, Lord Jesus. We declare their lives fertile ground, God. We declare fertile ground, Lord. We pray, Father God, for a harvest, 
Lord, that they can, um, through the through your power, multiply, Lord, what you've done in their lives for others. We declare them, Lord, Father God, sealed for you, sealed for your for your kingdom, Father God, and that they may share the good news that has stirred up, Father God, in their hearts and in their minds, and we declare it in their families. As school approaches, Lord, let your covering be over them, God, that even though the enemy might want to come in like a crow, Lord, to try to take those seeds and try to break down what you've started, it will not prevail, Lord. We are declaring them, Lord. Soldiers, Father God, a part of your kingdom, a part of the army, Lord, to continue to proclaim. We know that the, the, your day is coming, your return is coming soon. And so we need this very generation, Lord, to share with their friends, to share with their family, to share with their schools, Lord. We continue to proclaim revival, Lord revival over their lives, revival over their families, that they may know now in their youth that there is nothing better than to give their youth to you, God. To decide now in their youth to live the rest of their days for you. There is nothing better, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on. Give the Lord a great shout. Let it be so, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Yay. Yay. Go God. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Everybody can go down except you're going to stay up here. Hallelujah. You can all, you can all be. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. We got to give, sorry, five minutes to get up to the upper room where she is uh, interpreting for... Um, many of our Spanish friends. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. I, I love that, you know, God's given us the opportunity to be uh, multicultural, multi-generational in this church, and uh, also multi-denominational. Yeah. I mean, I think we probably have a little denomination of all types in this gathering here today. And, um, you know, God doesn't mind at all uh, because we all have his Holy Spirit. We're all walking in the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now, this young man here, Brother Johan, one of our young adults, he's an immigration attorney and uh, from Guadalupe. I mean, actually, that's uh, where you come from, which is an island in the Caribbean, way down there maybe off the coast of Venezuela, down that far? Not quite, not quite that far. Barbados, beyond, below Barbados, right? Yeah, so Guadalupe, and it's French, which is like your last name. How do you pronounce that? Zengeli. Zengeli, just like I thought. <laughs> Zengeli, Brother Johan Zengeli. Yeah, now I'm going to know that. But well, let me tell you what, this man is active, and uh, he's actively helping a lot of uh, our Hispanic brothers and sisters in uh, making sure they got their documents and papers to work and all that. And uh, we're going to arrange a meeting coming up soon uh, to just call on his and others in the house here that can assist, because I know some laws are changing, and just really appreciate uh, your your help in that area. But this guy assists volunteers in a lot of different areas in this house, and that's why he is this month's Volunteer of the Month. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen here, but we have a gift card for you, Brother Johan. And a little certificate here for you. We appreciate you. You are loved by the young people around here because you have a heart uh, that just keeps giving. I want to ask my son, Stephen, our young adults pastor here. He calls you his right hand, you know, in that ministry. And uh, what do you think, Stephen? Does he qualify? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> 
listen, I know I'm supposed to be like pastor and the young adults, but there's a lot of times where we just start the conversation and Johan just kind of takes off. <laughs> and it, it's, it's great because I don't have to do anything. <laughs> like there's like some people I'm always worried about, I got to, you know, clean up after or whatever, but he just nails it every time. <laughs> but I'm so thankful that you're over there and helping me and you're so active in everything that you're doing. It's awesome, man. Thanks for your help, brother. Pray over him. Your mama is delegating it to you. Everybody extend your hands right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you. <laughs> said lay hands. God, I thank you for my brother here. And I thank you that he's been so faithful. And I thank you that through every step of the way, it may not have been as easy as it could have been or should have been, but he's still smiling. And he's still carrying the fire. And he's still doing it unto you. And he's been so faithful. <laughs> never let me die. He's never let you die. God, I thank you for this brother in Christ. And I thank you for the many, many years of experience that he's going to gain and experience that he's going to lend to others. And I thank you for his knowledge and his help with me, with everyone else in the church, always volunteering, always having a great smile and a great attitude. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Johan. We love you. Hallelujah. I have to add my two cents. As soon as this young man walked in the door, that smile greeted me and I couldn't let him go. He's like the first guy on the hospitality team with that smile. That's, those smiles are nothing like his. And beyond that, he did grilling and he's done, you know what, this guy even empties the rubbish when he's done serving over the dining room for all the camps. Just God bless you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. I want to thank all of you for serving. Um, many of you are on the ministry teams. We're going to get together with our ministry team leaders, uh, I think, this week. Um, and uh, just ask you how it's going. Many of you are plugged into life groups. And I just encourage you, you know, beyond the corporate gatherings that we do on Sunday morning and Wednesday nights, uh, get into these small groups. And you'll, you'll grow. You really will. And you'll, you'll serve, you'll, you'll minister, and be ministered to. That's what it's all about. I'm going to ask Pastor Lewis to come up and just uh, assist us in our worship and giving today. Amen. Hey, and Johan, by the way, nobody knew how to say your name back there. We, we had a debate back there. We grabbed the name and we had a debate back there and none of us got, got close to it. So I had to put that in there. I had to let the cat out of the bag. So this. <laughs> Thank you. I did not come and give you. Let me go give you another hug, you know. Let me. <laughs> that's my, that's my Jesse. <laughs> so. Uh... <laughs> hey, it's he's supposed to be joyful. He's glad to be back home. Can you tell he's glad to be back home? I know he's he is, glad. isn't he? <laughs> It's joyful to, to sow, you know what I mean, into the kingdom of God. So this morning, there's a little flap on the envelope. So as you uh, get ready to give your tithes and your offerings, uh, fill out that flap. Um, this morning, uh, I was thinking about it, and I woke up about 6 o'clock this morning. And uh, I always think about, you know, farming and this, that, the other, you know, it's just stuff. I'm not a farmer or nothing like that, and don't think. And if you're a farmer out there, well, keep your thoughts to yourself because this is my, my thoughts. Of, uh, I'm not talking about hydroponic and that business. So I know there's, there's easier ways to do it. So uh, in my brain, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about when you sow a seed, right? When you sow a seed, what do you need? Back in the good old days when there was no computers or no internet or nothing, you know, it was a little seed and you stuck it in the ground, in the dirt, right? And when you stuck it in the dirt, what did you have to do? Water it, right? And then all of a sudden, why? Why did it shoot up? Sun. The sun, right? And you had to sit there and look at it, right? And what did you have to have? Faith. It's four properties. So, this, so then I started thinking about uh, wheat. 
And I don't know why it was wheat. You know what I'm saying? I could have made anything else. So I started looking at wheat. And, and don't get technical with me, but you know the little thingy that shoots out of the wheat, not the seed, the little thingy, right? I'm not a farmer. I'm a landscaper. Totally different thing. I know how to knock down a tree, lay some irrigation down, okay, and cut your grass. So the little thingy like that, whatever it's called, okay, has on average of shaft. 20. The shaft. <laughs> Is the whole thing they call the shaft? That's. I don't know. You see, there you go. <laughs> she, she's a preacher and she's a, t and she's a counselor. So we're, we're just going. So the little thingy like that, the little shaft or shoot or whatever you want to call it, the sprout, whatever it's called, okay, <laughs> gives about an average of 22 seeds. Out of this one seed, it gives about 22 seeds in that one little shoot. Okay, anywhere from 22 to 50. And then I started looking at it, and then um, the whole plant itself gives about five shoots. So when you look at it, but it takes water, it takes the dirt, good soil, okay? It takes light, and it takes faith. And I started thinking about it, and I go, without faith, okay, it's impossible to, the, uh, to, to please the Lord. And it's impossible, okay, without faith. And the thing is that we have to water and, I, and the whole watering thing, it started coming because I was talking to a couple, and, uh, and we were talking about how you should treat your wife and how it is, it's, uh, how to, you're supposed to wash your wife, right, with the, with, the, with the word. How to present her to yourself as a radiant church without spots, without wrinkles, without blemishes, blameless, right? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the seed. I just got excited on that part. So then uh, what happens? You have to wash. So I started thinking it, the, the, the word of God is like the washing, you know, it's like the water is the word of God. So when you plant a seed, when you write down the name of your seed this morning, okay, by faith, okay, you're going to water it. How are you going to water it? You're going to give it the word of God. You're going to speak the word of God into existence and to believe in it, right? Because when the sun hits it, when the son of God hits it, okay, believe in it, it'll produce fruit. It'll produce good fruit. Okay, and as Christians, we are dirt. I started thinking about it. We're supposed to produce good fruit. Remember, he said, be fruitful and multiply. What fruits are we given? So this morning, as we sow our seed into good fertile ground in here, think about this. When we sow, let's, let's sow with expectation. And then to top it off, four is miracle signs and wonder. You know, all four things. So I, I, I'm believing that God is going to do some miraculous uh, uh, things today, you know, and, uh, and in our lives. And that whatever we put on this flap, that if we believe in it and we trust in it and we're declaring the word of God over our lives, that it's going to come to pass. Amen? Amen? Let's hold our seat up in the air. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you, Father God. Ah. <sighs> Because you're amazing, Lord. You're awesome, Lord. You're, you're magnificent. Oh, Lord, I just can't even tell you how amazing you are, how great you are. Words cannot describe you, Lord, how faithful you are. All I can say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for, for being so awesome, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for staying true to your word, Lord. Thank you, Father God, that, that as we sow this seed, Lord, we're believing, Father God, that whatever we're writing in this flat, Father God, shall come to pass, Father God, by faith, Father God, Lord. We're going to please you, Lord. We're going to believe it because we're going to see things happen by faith, Father God. Changes happening by faith, Lord. Restoration is coming by faith. Healing is coming by faith. Finances are coming by faith, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, because it's all coming because of you, because of your word, Lord. Because we're standing on your word, Father God. And we just thank you, Lord. And we just ask you, Father God, just to shine on this light. Shine your light, Father God, on this seed, Lord, this morning. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. get a testimony. Um, I know Jesse's back from Japan, but Janine, you're back from Tacoma, Washington uh, with your team. Yeah, come on up if you would. Um, we all know and love Joan Pierce. She's one of the evangelists that still travels with a tent and helps churches get out of, the, get out of their seats into the streets. 
and you went with your team all the way to Tacoma, Washington for a week in a tent revival. Was it awesome? Okay, I could probably talk all day. I'll be honest, there's so many, like, God is so amazing. Jesus is amazing. I've never been to Washington. I've never flown that long. Actually, I used to be afraid to fly, actually. So this was amazing. But um, the so many things that happened, and it actually was things that I've maybe never done, like canvassing, going door to door, praying for people in rough areas, you know. But the biggest testimony was we were in this area, these apartment complexes, and we were about to leave. And this girl was highlighted to me that she was walking to her car. Her name was Kiera. And she had like a pillow. And then I go, hey, wait, are you coming to the tent revival? Here, here, here's a flyer. And I go, do you need prayer? And she says, actually, yes, I need prayer. My husband has been in a coma for a month. He was in a car accident. And she wasn't like a believer in Jesus, you know, like I felt in her heart. But the thing is, is she said that, um, that she, you know, think about her. She was pregnant. She was probably six months pregnant with her first baby. And I was just, my heart, when I saw her, I was like, wow, this girl, you know, 20-something years old, first baby, daddy is in the hospital. And think about her every day going right. there, hopeless. And, you know, is he going to make it? I don't know. And she said the only thing she thought was just to um, just pray. And she didn't know what, but just to pray. And I said, okay. So we prayed over her. And I heard when I was praying with her that that baby that their strong faith in God, that this, was, this is the day that it happened. I heard that the baby was going to like testify when it got older that, hey, I was there in this, these girls today. I mean, they just walked in this parking lot, and they prayed for me, and my dad woke up. Like, I just heard this so strongly. And I was like, Lord, I mean, you better, Lord, I hear this. <laughs> and so I, you know, and I just prayed with her. And she was so touched by the Holy Spirit. It was amazing. She, she just was in tears. She accepted Christ. Hallelujah. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I mean, that's like a double portion, right? I mean, she's <laughs> pregnant, so it's two, right? But um, so it was so beautiful because she was going to come to that tent revival. I said, okay, come tonight. It's going to be. So it, was, it was in a couple of hours only. I said, you're going to come tonight. I said, text me when you're coming here. I'll save a seat. Come by me. And I said, we are going. We prayed for him. We said, we said, Lord, just wake him up right now. Let this be a testimony. But we said, come tonight even, and we'll have someone stand in, and he is going to be healed. I mean, that morning before we went out, we pray, we pray in the tent every morning before we canvassed. And I heard from the Lord that today, that day, that the testimonies would be quick, the salvations would be quick, that the healings would be quick. Hallelujah. I heard that so clearly. And I'm telling you this right now. I text her and I said, hey, where are you? Are you here yet? She says, no, I'm at the hospital because my husband woke up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Amen. Praise Jesus. So I just want to say, you know what? That was uncomfortable for me even. I'm on the beach <laughs> preaching, but this was a whole different level. <laughs> Going door to door and that. I mean, I learned a lot of things. Hallelujah. But it overflowed to the beach. Yesterday I came back. Wild power of God fell over the whole beach. We had five baptisms. People healed. Six-year-old kids. Uh, deliverance. I'm telling you, people totally changed. Hallelujah. And so it's just amazing. So... Thanks for always supporting us, Pastor Phil. Listen, like, I, I just, I, I want you all to get this. You know, um, Janine, she's got a full-time secular job. She's a realtor. That's a busy, busy job, especially in this neck of the woods. Uh, but she's more on top of that. She's a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, that will keep you healthy, body, soul, and spirit. It'll bless your business. Because you take care of God's business and he'll take care of yours. Yeah. That's the way it works. Amen. Father, I pray a blessing, Lord, of everybody that was touched in this tent revival. Everybody that still walks into this beach outreach by the water every Saturday afternoon. Lord, those that are walking into the beach outreach every Sunday afternoon down at Siesta. Lord, I pray, Father, let, let your people rise up until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Hey, we got to hear more from you. Gene, I got to make time for you. But I, um, I love um, what God is doing in our midst. I want to hear from Brother Jesse. Been in Japan for a few weeks. And um, God is on the move. Look at somebody next to you and say, God is on the move. Make the declaration, God is on the move. And where does God live? In you. So he's in the move, in you and through you. Thank you, worship team. You know, yesterday um, we had our quarterly gathering of the Gospel Crusade ministers, pastors that are in our ministry network. Joan Pierce is one of those that's in the ministry network and having tent revivals. And I was telling the pastors about the fact that they were a part of a legacy or heritage of faith, of faith and revival. I've been telling you that too. This church was birthed out of a Mennonite church, a small Mennonite church about the size of our platform here today up in northern Minnesota, 23 miles out into the woods, the most least likely place. Uh, a young pastor and his wife, my parents, only 23 years old, the youngest pastors in the Mennonite church at that time, because of their passion, they got asked to be the pastors. Actually, they, they drew straws, and my dad's straw didn't get picked. Uh, but um, the guy that did get picked didn't make it in a couple months, and so my dad was the runner-up. <laughs> My dad and mom came into the Mennonite church, started praying for revival. Now, this was a denominational church that didn't believe in Pentecost. My Lord, we didn't even believe in instruments. Uh, we didn't believe in uh, the gifts of the Spirit, in healing or miracles. Uh, didn't believe in dance. Dance, children, dance. All that going on here this morning. Didn't believe in any of that. Uh, we read the stories of David dancing before the Lord, but just a lot of denominational, you know, legalism. But my parents got the whole church fasting and praying for revival. And a year later, when the Holy Ghost showed up, it looked very Pentecostal. Mostly teenagers in that church falling off the pews on the floor, speaking in tongues, prophesying. And it was a seven-day, seven-night revival. My dad thought it was just going to go on forever. Uh, and uh, people never went home. Can you imagine coming to church and watching your watch, and it just continues on day and night, day and night. They came over to our house. That story is written up in a book in bookstores, better bookstores near you, as they say, and in our resource center here called Following the Fire. So the part I want to get to is at the end of that seven days, the bishops in our church didn't understand that it was of God. I mean, my, my father didn't understand until, until just day after day, he couldn't deny that they weren't doing anything that God was orchestrating by the Holy Spirit in prophecy, telling them when to go to bed, when to get up, when to eat, who was on their way coming to the house, what to say, what to sing, when to pray. It was all supernaturally led by God. At the end of that, the bishop showed up and said, this can't be God, and asked my father to renounce it of being of the devil. He said, I can't do that. He said, well, if you don't do that, uh, we're going to silence you from your pastorate here, and that means you're out. They said, can you just agree that maybe 50% of it was of the devil? My dad said, no, I can't agree with that. Well, they were trying desperately to keep my dad in the pulpit. They said, could you just agree that only 10% of it wasn't of God? My dad said, I can't say that because I had nothing to do with it. God showed up, and this is what it looked like. They said, well, then you have to go. So we were put out of the church. But a prophetic word had come and told my father that he was to move his family to Florida. My dad and mom and three of us kids at that time. And uh, my dad was so convinced 
that everything that had happened in that revival was of God, that he went to the bank and asked him if he could borrow $100 to move his family to Florida. The greatest miracle was the banker said yes. He had no job. We knew nobody in Florida. It was only enough to get us one way, and they loaned him the money, $100. Most of you have that in, in your purse right now. My dad had to go to the bank. Of course, in those days, you could buy a house with $100. Just kidding. Not quite, right? <laughs> but I want to say my dad was a man of faith. He had the faith to borrow and build this place and many other places like it, churches all over the world and uh, orphanages and schools and uh, widows' homes. That's right. And today, we enjoy the fruit of an ongoing, self-sustaining miracle that began because a young pastor and his wife, my parents, just believed God. That's faith, my friend. That's something that you and I, we all have. And I want to give you a message today on faith. I kind of started in me on Wednesday night. And um, just uh, we were in the majesty room Wednesday night. And uh, I want to put some things up on the screen for you today to get it through your eyes and in your heart. And uh, help you understand that even though we've been raised in this, we have to be encouraged over and over again to keep our faith in focus because there's too many other things around us that, that you can get distracted by and you can get fixated on. Things like your problems, like the circumstances, my Lord, like the news. You know, I'm starting to hear this and hear that. I've heard recently, you know, that uh, we're not going to have currency anymore you know it's going to be digital currency i said well i've been functioning with a credit card long enough to know we're already in digital currency your bank does not have your cash in the bank they've got numbers somebody's out writing a bible now a new translation of the bible that takes god out of the bible that's how crazy it's getting listen you and i need to make sure we keep our focus we need to make sure that we are living in another world. It's the world of the kingdom of God. And that we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by feelings. Not by circumstances. I don't care what kind of chaos, what kind of storm that you're in. I want you to get a vision today to put your faith in focus. Give me my screens if you would today. I'm going to give you... A, a definition of faith and then help you understand that you can only walk this way with the power of the Holy Spirit within. You can't think your way into faith. You can't try to believe by, by just praying harder, praying longer. You need the Holy Spirit. And that comes through a growing relationship and taking time to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Faith, read it with me, complete trust and confidence in God. Complete trust and confidence in God. You know, a couple days ago, I was reviewing with Pastor uh, John here our, our prayer care list of people that, you know, are in need of a miracle or praying for healing or whatever it is, family, uh, marriages, that sort of thing. And, and uh, we have a list. And I was going over it, and I was just rejoicing because everyone on this list is literally walking in faith and believing, and they're focused to receive their miracle. You know, the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We are people of faith, but yet it's so easy for us to get distracted. The enemy's working over time to make that happen. Now, the Bible says... 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith. We live by faith and not by sight. We used to sing a song. I walk by faith each step by faith to live by faith. I put my trust in you. 
How many of you remember that throwback song? It goes, every step I take is a step of faith. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every prayer I pray is a prayer of faith. For if my God is for me, who can stand against me? I walk by faith, each step by faith. To live by faith, I put my trust in you. I don't know, that clapping just came from me. It just a little rhythm to that, right? But let me tell you, it doesn't just happen accidentally. I'm thinking of my brother Tom uh, Zobar, who said goodbye to his earthly wife. Here he is, still rejoicing in the Lord. Yeah, he, had, he experienced loss. It was unexpected that Jude uh, transitioned into heaven. I, I see Denise back there also. Her husband, we had a couple celebrations of life recently. It was unexpected, but here she is, walking by faith, putting her trust, putting their trust in God. Listen, no matter what you're going through, you got to know that God is there going through it with you, and you are going to be an overcomer. James 1 and verse 6 says, if you're asking God of something, ask in faith nothing wavering. For if you're wavering, you're like a man, uh, like being driven by the sea and the wind. Let not that man think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. Is that amazing? God says that we are double-minded if we're people of faith and we don't really walk and live by faith. I want you today to uh, receive a message in faith. I'm going to take you to... Uh, an account of God, Jesus, healing a blind man. Mark chapter 8. Turn there with me if you would. I, I covered a couple of these miracles I, I, on Wednesday night. And uh, I'm going to go back to this one. Uh, because uh, when you look at a healing of a blind man, it, it's very similar to... Us, if we're not walking by faith with our spiritual eyes open, then we're blind and we've got to have our eyes open. Here's a story of where Jesus, who was God, touched a blind man to heal him and he wasn't healed. Maybe you don't remember that story. At least he wasn't healed right away. He had to have a second touch. And what I'm believing is that there are people in the church today like us that we've been around miracles so much. We've seen so much. You need to be careful that you might have lost your focus on faith and you can find yourself rather fixated on the storms, the circumstances, the element of the natural realm that we live in. And when you do that, you're missing the potential that God has for your life. I want to say your fixation and focus will determine your faith and your future. Your fixation and your focus will determine your faith and your future. Let's read this story. Here we see they came to Bethadia and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he had spilled the man's eyes, what? A blind man, that's not nice, Jesus, spitting on the man's eyes. He put his hands on him. Okay, now we understand that. Lay hands on the sick, but spit on his eyes? What's that about, Jesus? And he looked up. Oh, no, he spit on his eyes, and Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. So once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Look at the fifth verse. I'm just reading you five verses. Verse 26. Then Jesus sent him home, saying... Don't go back into the village. Get a picture of this. 
Jesus is about to heal a blind man. And the first thing he does is lead him out of the village. Why is that important? Well, I'm going to show you why. I'm going to give you a three-question faith exam today. Here's the first question. Where do you live? Now, I don't mean your address, where you live naturally. Where are you living spiritually? This is so important. Because we are to be living in another realm of existence. We walk by faith. We live by faith. We speak by faith. Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me and lives through me. That's what I'm talking about. He led this blind man out of town. Because we read in another passage where Jesus actually cursed this town and a couple others, Chorazin and Capernaum, these three cities in Galilee where Jesus did most of his ministry, most of his miracles, and still these were cities, villages that would not believe, that didn't have faith. Jesus led this blind man out of the village Because he wanted to get him out of that place, that position, that fixation on unbelief. In this verse here, he even mentions Tyre and Sidon. He says, if these kinds of miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But woe unto you, Bethsaida, because you're an unbelieving place. He led him out of town. You know, we see in Matthew 13 that Jesus couldn't do many miracles in his hometown of Nazareth because the people had watched him grow up as a carpenter's son. They knew Jesus as a little boy. How could he be the son of God? And he couldn't do miracles there because of their lack of faith. You know, can we get so familiar with the things of God and the things of of the Spirit that we lose too the power of the Holy Spirit in us. I'm going to tell you another story. Remember Elijah? We had him preached about during the youth camp here a couple weeks ago and reminded me again of Elijah, you know, the great victory over the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. Fire falling from heaven. Elijah praying in the rain after it hadn't rained for three and a half years. Great victories. And then in the next chapter, Elijah lost his faith focus. Elijah now running after hearing that Jezebel was out to get him, out to kill him. Um, Well, I'm trying to to rush here. But... uh, Here's Elijah. And uh, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he didn't mean at that geographical place. Elijah, how far you've fallen? What are you doing here in this place of of fear instead of faith? And uh, it's interesting because God spoke to him and said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. Let me tell you, friends, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not just talking about that in a general sense. You cannot walk by faith without having fellowship. Not just relationship, but fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Last week I was talking about if you want to grow in holiness and righteousness, you know, we have to deliberately spend time on our knees, spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer. It doesn't happen automatically. To walk by faith requires us to have a relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God instructing Elijah, get into the presence of the Lord. Remember, he stood on the side of the mountain and the wind came by. The earthquake shook the place and there was fire, but God wasn't in those. You know, we were telling the youth uh, last week in our, our youth camp that, you know, the excitement of youth camp will not sustain you. 
It will be an encounter with God that will sustain you. And that's why night after night, they're coming to the altar. God told Elijah, go back. Go back the way you came. And then we know that it was that still small voice that Elijah heard that instructed him, gave him an instruction of what to do. Church, I'm, I'm saying that I'm, I'm calling us again to make sure that in the midst of a very chaotic world that's getting more and more out of order with God, we have to make sure that we are walking in the kingdom of God, in this bubble of his presence, having fellowship with God and hearing his voice and uh, keeping our focus and literally our fixation on him. I'm going to remind you of Nehemiah when he was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The enemy came and tried to get him off the wall, tried to get him out of his assignment. Your enemy also, it's the same enemy. It can come in the form of people like it did with Nehemiah, but it's still from the same source, the devil, and tried to get him to break his focus on the assignment that God had him. And said, come on down off the wall, Nehemiah, we want to talk with you. Come down here to the plain of oh no. I'm going to say the valley of oh no. We need to keep uh, ourselves operating on the mountain of oh yes, not oh no. If we want to walk in the miracles of God. Get out of the valley of oh no. Break your fixation on disappointment. Break your fixation on failure or excuses. On why life isn't going right. And get your focus on God. That's what I'm talking about today. God's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose. He's got an assignment for you. The happiest people in the church of Jesus Christ are those that no matter what their job is, they're living on assignment for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Aren't you excited about that, church? So my first question was, where do you live? You know, move out of that land of unbelief. Don't live there. But what do you see? Was another question that we see in this story of Jesus healing this blind man. Where is your focus? Is your focus on earthly things, on circumstances, or are you walking in the promises of God and heavenly minded? Jesus spit on the man's eyes. I kind of look at that as something that might get your attention. I was talking Wednesday night about the John uh, 9 account where Jesus healed the man born blind, and uh, it was a little bit different. He spit on the ground and made mud and slapped the mud in the blind, eye, in the blind man's face. That's not nice. Here I got a picture of that because they had cameras back then. And uh, here it is right here. But it says he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Let me tell you, that'll break your fixation on whatever it is. Here's a man that had, didn't even know what it meant to see. You and I, if we close our eyes right now, we would see darkness, but we would have an image of what this room looks like, what a chair looks like, what a tree looks like. Here's a man born blind. How could he have faith to believe in, in seeing? He didn't know what that even meant. Last week I was talking about Noah building an ark. God said, I want you to build an ark. It's going to rain. God, what's rain? Well, there's going to be a flood. What's a flood? Well, build an ark. Oh, yes, Lord. I'll get right on it. Make it exactly this size. Noah walked with God. He was a man of faith. This church, you're here, has a legacy of faith. My dad just stepped out. I, I've grown up with this. I, I saw him take risk. Many times I thought he was taking risk because he just didn't know better. He didn't know what could go wrong. To the contrary, he just believed God. Amen. By relationship with the Holy Spirit. Church, we're going to get better at that. Because don't think it's going to get any easier. 
I don't care who we have in the White House. It's not what's happening there that's going to matter. It's what's going to happen in the church house. And this is the temple of the living God. If people of God do not rise up, rise up and walk by faith and keep our eyes on Jesus, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of things that you can get fixated on and it'll just suck the life of Christ right out of you. That's not going to be us. Amen? So Peter, he discovered what it was like to get your eyes off Jesus. I want you to just remember in this story, Jesus sent the disciples into the storm. He said, you guys go on ahead of me. He knew the storm was coming. God knows the storms that are ahead of you. They're tests. They're opportunities for our faith to grow. They're opportunities for us to have a victory. I don't want hardship. I don't want a test. But the only way I graduated from high school is I had to pass some tests. I got promoted. The only way I graduated college was I had to pass some tests. And then I got my doctorate. Just call me Dr. Phil. I had to pass some tests. <laughs> I was so glad to get out of school because I hated testing. I still hate testing. But there's something great that comes, comes around when you know you've had a victory and you're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and you can add another testimony to your long list of things that God has delivered you from. I mean, I, I hate to tell you some of the same stories, but yeah, God saved my life many times. And I know it was God. And in the midst of some of the greatest danger, sometimes I was at perfect peace because I knew it wasn't my time. It wasn't my time to go. So, hallelujah. I don't know how you're going to do it, God. Here's Peter. The storm's raging. And... They're all, they all see Jesus, but only Peter recognizes that it might be Jesus. And Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And Peter steps out of the boat onto the water. Let me tell you, God's going to have us stepping out of the boat too. Don't think that life is going to continue to be as predictable as it might seem today. But guess what? He walked on the water as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. As soon as he got fixated on the wind and the waves, he started sinking. But Jesus is right there. Take my hand. Get back up. Walk on the water. That's what I'm talking about, church. I want to give you this scripture in reference to this. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light and momentary troubles, some of you are in trouble right now. Let me tell you, it's temporary. What you see with your natural eyes is what the Bible calls temporal. It's earthly. It's fleshy. It's, it's circumstantial. And it's temporary. Our light and momentary temporary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them. So we fix our eyes. Not on what is seen with our natural eyes, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is what? Temporary. Temporary. That means subject to change. No matter what you're going through, as difficult as it might be, the heart of God wants you to look through it. Look beyond it. Look for the light at the end of the tunnel. You're getting through this. Brother Tom, there's another chapter for your life. You're getting better. You're getting stronger. Denise, you're getting better. You're getting stronger. You haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Where do you live? What do you see? Moses, he's now 80 years old. And time is moving faster these days. You don't have to wait. So you're 80 to get about the father's business. 
But remember, he was 40. He knew he was an Israelite in Pharaoh's house. And he started trying to intervene. And he made a mistake. 40 more years in the desert caring for his father-in-law sheep. Oh, yeah, he had to get married. That'll tenderize you. Amen, married folks. That'll grow you up. He's 80 years old when he sees the burning bush. And the Bible says, when he turned to see, and I believe it meant when he turned to see with his spiritual eyes. He had seen other bushes burning before, but he said, this one's burning and not being consumed. I will now turn and see more clearly this strange sight. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, then God spoke. Some of you wish God would speak to you, and he will. He will. But I'm exhorting us to get our fixation off the natural things and get our focus on Jesus because that's where he's going to show up. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. This is right after the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. Then verse 1 says, And since we are surrounded by this whole cloud of witnesses in the clouds, he says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Aren't you glad God loves us too much to leave us the way we are? He's perfecting something. He's perfecting something in us. 2 Corinthians 4.18, I want to bring it to you again. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen with our natural eyes, but on what is seen by the Spirit. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Somebody say, yay, God. Yay, God. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Is it okay for me to have fun doing this? <laughs> Every once in a while, the devil tries to get me down. Now, I couldn't dance today because we were with my grandkids this past week, and they took us to a place in Orlando called Urban Air, and I caught too much air <laughs> trying to do backflips on a trampoline and not acting my age. And I came down wrong on an ankle. And so I'm grinning and bearing it, but I got, I need a healing for that ankle. But that's all I got wrong with me, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, let me finish up on this here. Will you receive a second touch? It's my faith exam. Where do you live? What do you see? Will you receive a second touch? Listen, never be at a point where you think you know it all. I'm telling you, these young people, they have the same full-grown Holy Spirit, and if they trust and believe in God, they don't have to have all the years that we have behind us. They're going to step out and make things happen. Hallelujah. I love it. But this man got a second touch. And last week, our, these youth, they got double dipped. They got baptized again. Most of these kids were church kids, preacher's kids. They'd been baptized. But most of them forgot really what it was all about. I said, look, baptism is an outward expression of an inner change. And you've been changed. You've left some things at the altar. Why not now bury them in the grave? in the muddy Manatee River. It's going to be muddy. It's going to be awful. Let's go. You know, boy, they all wanted to go, right? Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man, and look at this. Then his eyes were open, his sight restored, and he saw everything clearly. Hallelujah. I want to declare today, faith is progressive. We are being changed little by little, drip by drip. Let me remind you, that drip that's in the middle of our logo, it's not just a pretty picture. It means something. I want to put it up here. God gave me this some years ago uh, in, in a vision. My eyes were wide open, but I saw this and gave me four words. I said, God, give me four words that are not religious, 
that give us a picture of how to grow our faith. And he gave me these four words up here. And it wasn't until after I wrote the words down that I saw the acronym D R I P. I said, Lord, no, I don't want to be a drip. <laughs> And God began to roll it out. Drip technology. And I use the word technology because it, it, it means it's a systematic application of biblical principles that are progressively applied in your life. God didn't give the children of Israel the whole promised land right away. He said, I'm going to give it to you little by little. That's the way our faith grows as well. And the first thing that happens is discovery. And it's not just salvation. God wants to continue giving us discoveries all along. You'll get discoveries through healing, discovery through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, discoveries in hear, how to hear His voice. These are all discoveries. Every time you get a discovery, a wow in your life, it's going to have the immediate effect of connecting you better with God and with God's people. Relate. This is the process of growing your faith. You get connection with God and with God's people. And let me tell you, you can do that in this church through the life groups or through the ministry teams. And then as your faith grows, you're going to have encounters with the Holy Spirit. Now, we have a God encounter coming up uh, August 11th. And this is an opportunity for you to spend 40 hours with God. We'll put you up two nights in Miracle Manor as a part of it. A Friday night, all day Saturday, half day Sunday... And uh, you're going to have an experience, uh, inspirational experience. You look that word up in the dictionary, it says a divine influence on a person. Even Webster knows that inspiration comes from God. And ultimately, you grow in your faith, you will prove. You'll make full proof of your ministry. That's leadership. And uh, you'll be stepping out. And more into God's assignment. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I'm going to get into that more sometime. Martin Luther King Jr., he said this one time. I liked it. He said, faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. I thought that was good. I want us to all stand. I'm going to bring this to a close here today. I want us to repeat this verse together. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Listen, I believe that every one of you that are in the middle of a storm or some kind of a troubled area, you're going to get a victory. We're standing with you in faith. I brought this faith uh, message to you today. I believe God's going to use that. I want to ask you to... Break your fixation on the problem. You know, in fact, don't pray to God about your problem. Don't do that. Instead, talk to your problem about God, about your God. Prophesy over your problem. Get fixated on God. David, when he addressed that giant, he wasn't talking, when he addressed the king about going to fight the giant, he wasn't talking to the king about how good he was in natural warfare and battle, he was saying, God is with me. He helped me kill a lion and a bear with my bare hands. He said, that uncircumcised Philistine, he's going to fall like the others. Let me tell you, whatever your sickness is, whatever the enemy is trying to propagate in your life is uncircumcised. It's not of God. It's not of God. And you can lay hold upon the promises of God. And you can speak to that and tell it to remove itself from the temple of God. Hallelujah. Put your hand on your heart right now if you would. Father, as we make this declaration, Lord, of your word, I pray, Father, that you would increase, increase in power in the heart and the life of everyone that calls you Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at this scripture, if you would, with me now. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Let's all say it out loud. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, 
who is the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've asked the worship team to lead in this song. I hope we can put up the, the words. It says, come live in me all my life. Lord, take over. Come breathe in me, and I will rise. It says, may I know Jesus more and more. Let's start with the chorus. Can we do that? Come live in me. Make the declaration with me today. Come live in me all my life. All my life. Take over. Take over. Come breathe in me. Come breathe. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, rise up, rise up. Keep your focus on the promise of God. Your focus on the Word of God. And rise up in the name of Jesus. But we can't lay hands on you physically today, but we're standing with you. But if you're here today, I think sometimes just walking away from your seat and coming to the front is like unto stepping out of that place, maybe of, of unbelief, and coming to Jesus. Thank you. I don't know if you can feel that spirit, but man, man, man. God wants you to know that he's got that hand that reaches down and pulls you back up out of that water. 
so you could walk beside him. Peter had to get back to the boat. So he had to walk back with Jesus. That's what he wants to do with the people here. I believe he wants to take your hand and lead you back to the boat. Then guess what? He's going to get in the boat with you. Man, Jesus loves you guys. Every one of you. You guys, he loves you. He loves you, Crystal. He loves you. He loves you. Hallelujah. Tell him he loves you. So we had a great, great time there. There's so much I could say. But, you know, I think it's, the whole thing is, faith doesn't start until you make that step. Martin Luther King said the same way. You take the first step and then the rest of the staircase shows up. Let's start stepping out. Let's start saying, like I said before, what if it don't work? Well, what if it does? Hallelujah. Let's go and let's let's go with God. Let's walk and take our first steps. Step out in faith. You need to call me, 507-271-6108. Call me. We'll talk about it. Association of Christian Truckers at gmail.com. We'll talk about it. RomanEvilTruckersCenter.com, the website. We'll talk about it. Father, I thank you for today's service, for both services, Lord, for the for the Holy Spirit that showed up in both, for your word that showed up in both, for ways for people to change their lives that showed up in both. And even though they're in Florida and we're in Illinois, we together are serving God and asking you to be our God. And so, Lord, I ask that each person find out how to preach the gospel with every preacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us here at the Road Angel Church. Join the Road Angel Church. If you're a driver and you don't have a church, we'll be your church. We are the Road Angel Church. We understand truckers. And if you're not, if you can't make it, that's great. Guess what? Jump on YouTube at Association of Christian Truckers YouTube channel, and we're right there. I'm there. Eric's there. Eric's doing the Bible study every week. We're there for you. We love you. And until next time, I'm going to say what I always say. Roll on with Jesus.